Hi friends and welcome to this online service for the fourth Sunday in Epiphany. We may not all be gathered in the same building, but at this time when we need each other so much, we're invited to worship together from where we are, knowing that God can hear us all and can blend even distant voices into one song of worship. We light our candle as a reminder of God's presence with us wherever we may gather. As you enter this worship space, bring with you all your joys and sorrows. Jesus will offer hope. Come believing in the power of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus will bring us healing. Come feeling the presence of God. Jesus will teach us new ways to live. The Lord is our strength. The Lord is our light and salvation. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, a light which no darkness can quench. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, you pull on your work boots, crafted from love. You hang justice and peace on your tool belt. You take on rebuilding neighborhoods when we would walk away. What have you to do with us, holy God? You model compassion for us. You take us by the hand to lead us to our feet to show us the path which leads to humility. You leave a trail of grace crumbs so that we might follow. What have you to do with us, brother of the poor? You call us to serve by your side. You plant words of peace deep into our hearts. You raise up little children to whisper hope to us. You stand by the side of all who look for life. What have you to do with us, Spirit of Grace? You teach us how to build up others with love. Forgive us, Holy God, and have mercy on us. May we silence our fears so words of hope may be spoken. May we give thanks, not only with our hearts, but with the grace we can share with others. May justice and peace be the tools we use as we serve beside Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. What have you to do with us, God in community, holy in one? Everything, it turns out. Everything. As we lift our prayer to you, we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. We listen to a song now, God himself is present. <laughs>
Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, and verses 21 to 28. Jesus and his disciples came to the town of Capernaum, and on the next Sabbath, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people who heard him were amazed at the way he taught. For he wasn't like the teachers of the law. Instead, he taught with authority. Just then, a man with an evil spirit in him came into the synagogue and screamed, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you here to destroy us? I know who you are. You are God's holy messenger. Jesus ordered the spirit, Be quiet and come out of the man. The evil spirit shook the man hard, gave a loud scream and came out of him. The people were all so amazed that they started saying to one another, What is this? Is is this some kind of new teaching? This man has authority to give orders to the evil spirits and they obey him. And so the news about Jesus spread quickly everywhere in the province of Galilee. Thanks be to God for this word to us. <clears throat> Last week we looked at Jesus' first sermon, in a sense, where he said, The time has been fulfilled. The moment has arrived. The reign of God has come near. Or the reign of God is within your grasp. Repent, turn around, change your whole way of thinking and being. And believe in, trust the good news. And we saw that as Jesus called the first disciples to follow him, they put this message into practice. They, they, in, their, in their radical obedience to leave everything behind and to, and to commit to following Jesus, they put this into practice. They became a part of spreading God's reign, living out the good news that God's reign is indeed within our grasp. We also said that call is for all of us. As we follow Christ's way of justice, mercy, peace, grace, and love for all people. Not only those who deserve it, but all who would seek that way. This week's reading follows directly on from that reading. And it demonstrates the message that Jesus preached. It demonstrates God's reign breaking through into the lived reality of our lives and our world. The first thing that Jesus does when he gets to Capernaum is to go to the synagogue and teach. And the people are amazed at the way that he teaches. We're told that he taught with authority. And the gospel writer specifies that this was not like the authority of the experts in the law, the religious leaders of the day. In fact, the people weren't just amazed, they were shocked. And it was all about the authority with which Jesus taught. The teachers of the law taught from the law. The books of Moses, that's where their authority came from. Their authority came from Moses and the books of the law. But Jesus' authority comes from God. In fact, Jesus' authority comes from within Jesus himself. The word translated as authority is the Greek word exousia, exousia, and it literally means out of being, out of 
existence. Jesus' authority comes from within. Jesus' authority comes from who he is, not from what he says or because of his position or title. It, it comes from what he says and does and who he is. All of those match. The scribes had a second-hand authority that came from the law, that came from Moses. Jesus' authority is constantly contrasted with the religious authority and with political authority of his time and his day. Jesus' authority brought healing and growth. It, Jesus' authority did not squash or diminish. Jesus' authority didn't force or coerce. Jesus' authority was about freedom and not control. The scribes and the religious leaders seek to control people. Jesus seeks to set them free. There's a relationship between power and authority and love. And it appears that Jesus' authority is different from the kind of power and authority of the religious and political leaders of his day. Samuel Taylor Coleridge said, In religious matters, it is holiness which gives authority. And I would want to say that I think it's in all matters that holiness gives authority. Not titles, not second-hand authority, but that which comes from God, that which comes from within. When, when what we do, what we say, and, and who we are all match like Jesus did. Jesus has the authority of the Creator. If you want to know the meaning of something, it's helpful to go to the source. If you want to know the, what the author's meaning of it is, we need to go to the, to the source, to the author itself. We, if, if we want to know the, the, the meaning of a painting, we need to go to the painter, the source. That's why Jesus has authority over all things. Because Jesus has the authority of the creator of all things. And that includes evil forces of darkness. When Jesus taught, he said things like, You have heard it said in the law, now I tell you. He said, for example, you have heard it said, and he quotes the law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But now I tell you, turn the other cheek. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. On the road to Emmaus, after his resurrection, we're told that Jesus explained to those he was with on the road what was said about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. Jesus started his ministry with the words, the time has been fulfilled. The moment has arrived. But Jesus doesn't only speak, he demonstrates in action to prove his authority. As he is teaching, a man with an evil spirit comes in and identifies Jesus as the Holy One of God. Jesus commands the evil spirit to be quiet and leave the man, and to leave the man, and the spirit obeys. The man is set free. Jesus' authority is shown in action, not just words. God's reign is demonstrated. 
One of the commentators I read put it this way. The exorcism by Jesus was a dramatic gesture that the rule of God had begun. The exorcism was not proof that Jesus was the Son of God, which some miracle workers might claim, but that God was effectively present. Jesus' authority over illness and demons, over the law and its application, stems from the sense of urgency that his announcement of the proximity of God's reign encapsulated. The story was treasured to indicate that real power was with them in the midst of universal upheaval. Real power is with us, even in the midst of universal upheaval. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus is teaching at the synagogue just as he is in this passage from Mark's gospel. But there he's in Nazareth, and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed. And announce that the time has come, and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, to set free the oppressed. This incident reminds us that Jesus sets us free from all that which oppresses us, including the religious and political authorities and and leaders, and systems, and powers. Jesus concluded that quote from Isaiah with the words, Today the scripture has come true in your presence. When Jesus' cousin John the baptizer sends his followers to Jesus to confirm that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the fulfillment of, Jesus says, tell John what you see. People are healed and people are set free from that which oppresses them. As Jesus comes in, he sets people free from that which imprisons them. His coming causes release from all oppression. God's reign is indeed among us. And the Spirit of Christ continues that work in and through us as we continue to build for God's perfect reign here on earth as it is in heaven. God is in control, even though it may not seem like it. Real power in the midst even of universal oppression. We are called to follow him as we continue his work of liberating all from that which robs us of life. Last year, Micah 6 verse 8 was the focus and at our covenant service we spoke about that and committed ourselves to that for the year. Micah 6 verse 8 reminds us that God has shown us what is good and what God requires, and that is to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. And that is what our connection, the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, committed ourselves to to doing, to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. This year, we continue to commit to that, even as we have to reimagine how we do church. Whether we gather or not, our call is to work with God for healing 
and transformation. As we act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Those around the man who came into the, the, the synagogue on that Sabbath knew that he needed to be healed. They knew that he needed to have this evil, oppressive force cast out from within him. In fact, they probably recognized that they all needed this evil force of oppression to be cast out from their presence. But none of them did it. They may have even said to one another, it's too bad about that poor guy. Someone should do something about it. Kind of like what we say in similar situations. Ach, shame. Someone should do something about the crime and the violence. Someone should do something about hunger and poverty. Something should, somebody should do something about, about gender-based violence and the violence against women and children. Someone should do something about all the AIDS orphans. Then Jesus came and he commanded the demon to come out of the man and it did. The spirit obeyed him and the man was healed. That which sought to oppress him was, was released and he was released. Jesus had the authority and the power needed to make a difference. He had the authority and power of God, a power which can change any situation, can heal any person can set anyone free from that which seeks to oppress them. And Jesus still has this power and authority, and he offers it to us. He calls us to do the work of God in this world. He calls us to employ the power of God, the authority of God to heal, to teach, to bring justice and to grant mercy. When we put ourselves at Jesus' disposal, when we speak his words, when we act according to the teachings he has given us, when we pray and study the word of God and ask God to use us, even us, to establish God's reign, the demons around us will begin to disappear too. Let's pray. God has shown us a new way in Jesus. God has made a new covenant with us, promising us forgiveness and fullness of life if we but trust and obey. God, our creator, we pray that the peoples of the world and their leaders may ascend to your new covenant of love and life to new ways of living together in peace and plenty that cannot be contained in the old schemes of institutionalized injustice, greed, and the lust for power. We pray for new ways, bringing hope for the future. You are our God, and we are your people. God, our Savior, we pray that human beings might acknowledge their spiritual needs and ascend to your new covenant of love and life, to new ways of understanding your compassionate generosity that cannot be contained in the old beliefs that led to fear and guilt, anger and despair. We pray for those who seek your new way. You are our God and we are your people. God, our inspirer, we pray that we, your people, might together wholeheartedly embrace your new covenant of love and life, your new joyful way to salvation that cannot be found in the old tendencies of religion to be exclusive, complacent 
and burdensome. We pray for the church, that we might be united in following your new way of self-giving love. You are our God and we are your people. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who did not come to call the virtuous, but sinners to salvation. Amen. At this time of the year, in Methodist tradition, we renew that covenant of love and life, as we are reminded that God calls us to share love and life with others. During the week, I sent out the covenant prayer. I hope you received it. In a moment, we will be praying that prayer together, as once again we renew ourselves to this covenant of love and life given to us through Jesus Christ. This covenant of life and love that is entrusted to us to continue. A little later on there at uh, 10 o'clock, live on Facebook, the Synod Covenant service will take place. It will also take place on YouTube and the audio of that service will be made available and we will be shared with, with those who are not able to access YouTube or Facebook. And so in some way, we're all invited to commit to this time of covenant renewal, this time of committing ourselves to life and love, the life and love of God. I encourage you to join in a little later on to the Synod Covenant service that will go live at 10 a.m. And it will remain on the Cape Methodist Facebook page. If you're not a part of that, just type in the search and Facebook Cape Methodist. Do the same in YouTube and you will find the page and hopefully find the service. I'll also share the links on Facebook and uh, with, with you and in the the comment section of of this video, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. But for now, the words will come up on your screen, and I invite you to say the words together as we say the covenant prayer together as we do at the beginning of every year in our Methodist tradition. Let's just pause for a moment and be still as we prepare ourselves to say these words together. We say together, I am no longer my own, but yours. Your will, not mine, be done in all things, wherever you may place me, in all that I do and in all that I may endure. When there is work for me and when there is none, when I am troubled and when I am at peace, Your will be done when I am valued and when I am disregarded, when I find fulfillment and when it is lacking, when I have all things and when I have nothing. I willingly offer all I have and am to serve you as and where you choose. Glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. May it be so forever. May this covenant now made on earth be fulfilled in heaven. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. We're going to close off with a beautiful song that reminds us of our call to set people free from all those things, political systems, religious systems, all the evil forces of oppression in this world. 
who will speak for those who cannot speak?